going to go ahead and uh, have my mask off while I speak to you since we're very, very far away. And just because I feel like it's a little easier to hear what I'm saying and to see my face while I'm talking to you. So um, we are going to go ahead and get started. I know we're a small crowd right now, which is totally okay. I know that we have the live stream running, so I'm sure there are um, folks tuning up tuning in uh, virtually as well. Um, but to begin, I'd love to introduce myself. My name is Angela Sangerberger. I am the coordinator of middle school uh, youth ministry here at Christ the Redeemer. Uh, and I am excited to talk to you today about RISE. Uh, but before we get too far into it, I'd love to open us up in a prayer. So if you'll join me, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this day, uh, for the gift of this moment. In particular, Lord, I thank you for the cooler weather um, that visited us this weekend. Lord, I ask that just whatever is going on right now in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in the craziness of the school year and the schedules, all the things, Lord, that we're trying to grasp onto and to manage and to control, Lord, we just take a moment to give them to you that we surrender everything to you, Lord, because you know exactly what we need. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this time that we have together today, that you would um, bless every single one of our parents uh, here and, and watching today and those that could not make it, uh, and that you would extend that blessing into their families, into their children's lives, um, that you would hold them in the palm of your hand, Lord, and close to your heart. And Blessed Mother, we offer this uh, time to you, uh, that it would be under your intercession, and that you would lift us up to uh, the foot of your Son's throne as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
All right, well, welcome again. Uh, before we go further, I'd love to introduce the rest of our team. So I already introduced myself, uh, but wanted to point out Stacy McKay, you would have seen her in the lobby on your way in. She is our office manager, and generally she keeps, she keeps us afloat. So she is the engine of this ship. She handles all of the paperwork, all the registration data. Uh, if you ever have a question about service or things that are coming up, she is like the epicenter of all information and logistics, which is incredible. Um, she's a huge asset to our team. And then Rachel Smythe, who's in the back on the computer running the live stream for us back there, uh, who's the director of the youth ministry department uh, and also keeps everything together. Uh, the one that's not up there is Tommy, who is our high school youth minister, who you will meet in a couple years when your student goes on into ninth grade encounter. Uh, but that is our team here. Uh, and as we uh, begin today, I recognize that this for a lot of you is your transition from RE uh, and going to faith formation classes and kind of being used to what that's like into youth ministry, which can, is, is similar and can seem very similar, but also is different. You know, we're getting different emails, we're getting a different schedule, things are kind of changing. And so uh, the purpose of this and um, all that we, you know, send out and communicate is really to help make that transition smooth because RE and youth ministry are markedly different uh, for a reason. Uh, and it's all towards helping your child as they grow grow and as they develop and as they need more and they need different things when it comes to understanding their faith that we're meeting them where they are and not leaving them there but walking them closer. And so as we kind of introduce you to like what is youth ministry and, and what do we do here and what is RISE, um, we'd love to just start with going over what our goal is uh, as a staff and as a department, what is our goal? And it is to partner with you as the parents uh, to nurture authentic faith in the lives of young people. So to partner with you to nurture authentic, real, real true faith in the Lord uh, in the lives of all of our young people, uh, those in our program and, and those beyond. Uh, but that is what is underneath everything that we do. In Rise and in Encounter with Confirmation, yes, but, but really in every single email that we send and, and resource that we put forward, that's, that's our heart is to work with you and to partner with you because you as the parents are the primary catechist. You're the primary teacher of the faith to your child. And recognizing the extreme importance and the weight of that role uh, that only you can hold, uh, it is, it's our privilege to walk with you and to support you in that and to do what we can to um, partner with you in bringing about real faith, uh, not just going through the motions faith or I understand the facts and figures faith, but real faith that's a response to the invitation of God who wants to love uh, each one of us personally and individually. And so with this um, with this goal, with this goal in mind, we have three kind of beliefs that guide how we view our relationship with you as parents uh, of children in our program. And these three beliefs are, number one, that we believe that every parent wants to be a better parent. Um, I'm not a parent myself, uh, but I know that that's I'm sure that's true for my parents, uh, for my siblings that are parents, and for parents everywhere that you that you want to be you want to be a good parent, right? You want to love your child well. Uh, you want to be the best that you can be for them, and you want them to have a good life, right? I think that if you stopped any random parent on the street and you asked them, "What do you want for your child?" I'm sure that a lot of them would say something similar to, I, I want them to be happy. I want them to have a good life. I want them to be successful, uh, which are all great things. Um, and I think often a lot of parents will say they, they want better for their child than maybe they had or maybe they experienced. Uh, and I don't know how much that crosses over into how the parent themselves received their faith, but I hope that for parents, they have a desire for their child to be taught the faith and to be handed on the faith in a way that's maybe a little bit better than how they maybe received it, that we're always getting better, we're always improving. And so in just general parenting and when it comes to passing on the faith, I believe that every parent wants to, wants to be a little bit better each day than they were the day before. The second belief that we hold to be uh, central to this is that every parent wants to be able to talk to their child about God. That there is a desire to have a conversation about faith and about belief that's beyond just, you know, this is what, you know, we heard at Mass today or this is what you learned in class. But to really get to the heart of what is it that, what is it that I believe and what is it that you believe and how can we understand this faith that I, as the parent, am passing on to you. How can we understand this better together? And that I think for a lot of parents, um, maybe there is some hesitation uh, in talking about the faith or feeling like you know enough to talk about the faith or um, feeling the, I don't know, courage to kind of cross that, um, that boundary of the conversation with your child, especially if you have a child in middle school who when you ask, what did you learn today? They're like, nothing. What are you, why, do you, why are you asking me what I learned today? Or they're like, oh, what did you do at school? Nothing. You, you did nothing. You did nothing all day. You stared at a wall. And they're like, yeah. 
That's it. And you're like, okay, great. This was a great conversation. I'm so glad that we had this equal communication of thoughts and feelings. Um, but I, I believe that every parent does desire to have that conversation, does desire to be able to share that with their child and to be a place where their child comes to um, for advice and encouragement, answers to their questions, especially when it comes to the big stuff, right? The stuff about God and, and what am I here for and who am I? So every parent wants to have that conversation. And then the last thing is that we believe and we do hope that it, uh, it comes across this way, that we're in a position to help, that we're in a position to help support you as a parent and to help you with that conversation so that um, we're partnering with you in this. And it's not something that you feel like you're doing totally on your own or something that we feel like we're to totally doing on our own when it comes to teaching them about God. And so those are our kind of core beliefs in this, this partnership that we want to have with you. Uh, and we brought this image up, I think, last year. It kind of floated around the Internet, and it really strikes me when I look at it every time. And it's this image of ping pong balls, which are not terribly exciting, just on their own. Uh, but you'll see the text in the slide also illustrates what it's saying. The smaller vase on the left of ping pong balls represents the number of hours, typically, that a, a young child has at their church for faith formation, for CCD, for RE. And then the ping pong balls on the, on the right side in the huge cylinder is, is the hours, number of hours a year that a parent typically has with their child, which is basically every other hour that they're not in school or in activity. And, it, and I'm, I'm sure it varies based on, you know, work and activities, but that's kind of the general comparison. And so seeing this, we realize that we... We need one another uh, to do this, to be able to teach about God, to speak about God to this next generation, uh, that we work together and that um, ideally the conversation that we have here about who is God and what do we believe and what is our Catholic faith doesn't just stay here and doesn't end here, but extends beyond into your time with them as well, um, that we can support and be a part of uh, in our own role as well. So with that, I kind of mentioned this idea before, but Going back to our goal, our goal is to partner with you. Uh, our goal is to partner with parents, and we see this as a shared partnership between us, between you, and between your child, that we're all partners in this endeavor together, um, all walking step by step to achieve this goal of, of drawing closer to the Lord. And so in this partnership, in any good partnership, uh, for a partnership to be successful, each party uh, should know kind of what is my role here, and what do I hold myself to be responsible to, and what do I expect of the other partner in upholding their end of things. And so kind of taking that idea in a loose way, we've kind of broken it down into, okay, what, what do we as, as Christ Redeemer Youth Ministry say we're holding ourselves responsible to do in this partnership uh, with you? And so a few different things. Uh, first is the weekly teaching. Uh, so each week at RISE, we present on a different topic regarding our faith. And so we have a two-year middle school curriculum. So we start um, with one year, and then we go to the next year of topics, and then we flip back to the first year topics uh, after that. So it rotates through, ideally, if the student's starting in seventh grade, they'll get seventh grade topics and then eighth grade topics, and they'll move on to uh, encounter. And those topics uh, vary between um, the Trinity, who is God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. We actually talk about that every single year because each member of the Trinity is so vast that we can't just talk about it once and be like, you got it, you got it, three persons, one God, you understand it, great, we'll move on. Uh, but we want to talk about that each time so we can deepen our understanding of who God is. And we talk about creation, we talk about um, all the different sacraments between the two years, we talk about moral life, so, so how do I know what is right and wrong, what is the natural law, like, let's go beyond just like what are the Ten Commandments into how do I form my conscience, how do I live the life that God asks of me, what does God want for my life, and and so typically the topics such as who is God and who am I and, and where did this all begin kind of starts in the fall. So it's kind of the fall semester topics. And then usually in the spring is when we get into things uh, more like applied church teaching of how do we live this out? What does this look like in our world and in society and in my own life to live this way, to follow Christ? Uh, and so... That is how our semester is usually broken up. But each week at RISE, myself or one of the other youth ministers gives a teaching on one of those topics that we follow in the curriculum. So this year it's all video-based, which means that we're recording the talks a couple weeks before they actually come out, whether virtually, online, or in the small groups for the students attending in person. So sometimes I have to remind myself, okay, what week are we on and what are we talking about tonight? Because it's been two weeks since I actually talked about it. Uh, but nevertheless, they are getting that content week by week of that teaching uh, on the faith. And then in addition to that, we have our resources that we're putting out for um, primarily for our virtual parents, but are really open to all of our parents and our program. And these resources are um, three to four extra pieces, whether it's a song or an activity or another video or um, just a different way to connect the dots between this is what I'm hearing 
and this is how I understand it. This is how I apply it. This is how I take it a step further. So we come up with a few resources for every single topic that we do throughout the year. We've been posting them on our website as we go through each topic and really primarily sending those out to virtual parents who are doing this material at home with their child, but it is open to all, um, all parents so that they can continue the conversation, so that it's not just something that maybe ends outside of the RISE uh, small group, but it's something that you can say, okay, let's, let's continue to build on this. Let's, make, let's bridge the gap between that conversation you had there and this conversation we're having here. And so they're meant to be engaging and interesting and to approach it from a different standpoint. You know, there's some activities that honestly, looking at the activities, I'm like, I kind of want to do this. This looks fun. Um, so a way to kind of bring it more into their life than just when they get dropped off um, at church. And so those resources, as well as the small group. Uh, so this would be just for the students that are attending in person is the small group element of RISE and of Encounter. And we really believe deeply in the small group component. And it's maybe something different that they would have experienced in RE, just typically because the classes in RE tend to be larger. Uh, but when they come and they experience small group, we limit it to 10 students because we really believe that uh, for a small group to be effective, it needs to actually kind of be small uh, so that the students know each other and that it's a, it's a place that can become like a family to them, that they can trust that the people that are in this small group with them um, want to hear what they have to say, will respect what they have to say, will answer the questions they have, will pray for the intentions they share, all led by an adult leader. And then with RISE, we have some high school teen leaders that help out as well. And so that small group component uh, is really a crucial part of what we do. And then uh, in addition to that, our weekly communication. So we send out a flock note uh, every week, uh, usually on Mondays. Uh, for our virtual families, we send another one on Wednesdays with the video for that week, so communication. And then this last piece I'd like to highlight just that we are in this partnership very open to advice and to feedback. I know that this is a strange year. There's a lot of adjectives we could use to describe this year and this current moment that we're in. I'm gonna avoid a particular one that we're sick of that begins with you, but this year is, is odd, and it's uh, put us all in interesting places that we didn't think we maybe would be a year ago. And I know that there is strains upon parents and family life in a way that maybe has not been experienced before. And so with that understanding in mind, um, we just want to offer again and again that we want to work with you and we want to support you and we want to listen to what you have to say and to how we can help you because that is our desire is to partner with you. And so just to emphasize that. Moving on into the kind of the parents column of, of what are what are parts of this partnership for parents. The first one is weekly mass, uh, just to make that a um make that a part of your family life and how you, uh, how you celebrate the faith, right? This is what we, we've grown up learning we should do. Uh, it's what the Lord asks of us each week. Uh, but our, our desire and our hope is that that's something that's a part of your family life as well because truly um, what, what happens at mass is way more uh, soul effective and changing than, than even what we do on Wednesday nights. Uh, and it's more um, nourishing to their spiritual life than maybe the conversations in small group. Not because small group isn't impactful, but because you can't come close to the Eucharist in any other place, um, as close as you do in Mass. And so the importance of that uh, and making that a part of how they celebrate their faith. Ooh. It went away. Okay. Uh, the next one, I believe, is uh, to go to confession as a family. Uh, this is something that um, I know that the students that I shared with me, like, oh, yeah, my family, we go to confession, you know, once a month. We just all go. It's normal, and this is just a thing that we do. Is like, it's like a mind-blowing concept of, like, that's beautiful. That's something that you do, and that's something that I think we all wish there was a little bit more of because I think when we look at confession and um, – Maybe this is just me, but I know that for some of our students as well, there is this hesitation or this fear, or this insecurity of like, I just haven't done it in so long and I don't know what to do and I feel nervous or afraid um, when it comes to going to confession. And so going as a family and making it a part of this is how our family does our faith um, kind of takes away a little bit of that um, maybe that nervousness or that kind of taboo of like, I don't really know what that's about, um, but just the desire to, to come to the sacraments and to receive that grace. Uh, the next piece is to assist uh, assist your child with whatever it is, um, whether it's virtual or they're attending in person with whatever questions they have or uh, wherever they are in the journey, uh, just to assist them, which you're, you're already doing. Um, the next is to communicate with the small group leader. So again, this is for students who have... Um, families who have students attending in person, they're in a small group that they're with each week. And really the goal here is that they actually journey with that same small group this year into next year, into the next year, into the next year. So that starting in seventh grade, they become part of this family that they get to walk with for four years. And that's why it's 
it makes me very glad um, and very excited that you've chosen to start with your child in seventh grade because that is that's the goal. And it's been beautiful to see as we reopen this last this this year um, for in-person faith formation that for our high schoolers specifically, a lot of them opted for in-person, whether virtual or in-person. They they opted for in-person because they wanted to be with their small group because that was the relationship that they had that they wanted to be with those people again. They didn't want to you know miss out on that. And so just the it just bears testimony to the witness of that small group connection. And so the small group leader, as the head of the group, is kind of the, the, the main point of contact um, for what your child's small group experience is. And so just to communicate with them, typically they send out an introduction email around the beginning of the first few weeks of the year to say, hey, this is who I am. I'm here to answer questions, here to give you insight on what's happening in small group, and um, just here to be another uh, support to you as we partner with you. So that's the small group component. Uh, and then to communicate your needs to the staff. And so whether the need is, I need to know what the deadline is to sign up for this thing, or I need to know where to find this information on the website. Those are great needs. Please tell us you need them, and we'll, we'll uh, do what we can for you. Uh, and really, the bigger need that we, um, we really hold dear is... Um, what can we pray for? And we take time every single week as a staff to pray for you, uh, to pray for your intentions, uh, especially like if we know of a specific intention, we pray for that intention and that person by name uh, because we believe that prayer works and we believe that prayer is powerful and that we can rely upon one another for prayer. And so that's why you see those orange sheets by you. And if you didn't sit down where one is, you can grab one from another seat. But I just ask that before you leave, you write something down that we can pray for you for. It, doesn't have, it can be anonymous. Uh, it doesn't have to be detailed, but we just would love to pray for you. Um, and so we take that... Uh, uh, need uh, seriously as well. And then the last piece is, okay, what are the expectations of the student in this partnership? What are they um, responsible for? The first one is to dress appropriately. Uh, so you'll see on the handout that you grabbed on, as you came in, there's two different sides. There is the dress code and then the code of conduct. Um, neither of them are uh, revolutionary. They're not very, very different um, from what we've kind of put out before or maybe what you'd expect. Uh, the dress code really comes from a place of recognizing the dignity of every single person uh, and wanting each person to be seen with their utmost dignity and not seen as a particular body part that attention is drawn to or seen as anything less than what they are. And so that's where that comes from. Um, and really also part of it is recognizing that when we come to church, we're doing something different. This is a different place. This is a different time. This is a special um, opportunity, and it's not the same as maybe being at home or maybe going shopping or maybe going to soccer practice. Like, I would not come to Rise in, like, full, like, football pads and gear, right? Because I wouldn't be dressed appropriately for the activity that I'm going to do. And so kind of that mindset of how do I dress appropriately for the activity I'm going to, how do I dress in a way that honors myself and invites other people to honor me as well, uh, especially when we come into this different setting of church. And so that's where that comes from, and there's explanations there. Uh, the next piece of the Code of Conduct, again, is... Um, Nothing uh, super surprising. Just a special mention as far as COVID goes is that this year we're putting an extra emphasis on making sure that we follow where we're supposed to go and what door we're supposed to enter just because things have been designed with uh, an intentionality to keep students as separate as we can, limited to their small group. So just the additional emphasis on let's go where we're supposed to go, let's know where we need to go and when we need to be there just so we're kind of following the order of how things are set up. Uh, and then the last piece is to engage with the material. So for seventh grade, we don't have have any extra components of a retreat or service that, that comes in the following years. But seventh grade, it's really just come on in. Come on in and continue the journey that you've already begun in your faith. And so just we ask them to engage because we work really hard to make what we do engaging and on their level in a way that they can understand and that they can um, critically evaluate. Because I realize that at this time in their life, they're starting to critically evaluate and say, I don't know if I believe this just because I'm told. I want to ask questions. I kind of want to maybe resist a little bit, maybe not in a negative way, but just in that tension of I'm starting to see myself as a seventh grader as like a little bit more of an adult, and I want to be seen as a little bit older than I am, and so I want to kind of push back maybe, and we want to give them a space where they can ask those questions and trust that they will be answered. Uh, if we, if we can answer them. I mean, if they ask me to really under, explain the Trinity in fullness, I can't because it's a mystery. So some, some questions end in a mystery, but they uh, have the security and the safety within their small group to be able to be seen as, um, as someone who, whose questions are worthy of answering uh, and that it's a safe place to ask them. And we much prefer when students do ask the questions, like, I don't really get this or I don't know if I believe it because it shows that they're actually thinking about it. And that it's not just, I'll go through the motions and I'll show up because my parents want me to, but I'm actually starting to think about this. And so that's our goal there, is that they would engage with the material. And so those are kind of the, the pieces of the partnership there. Um, 
And really, as we move through kind of the, the do's and or the, the ins and outs of like, what are we all doing in this partnership? Um, why is this crucial? Why is this important? Why, why should we care about, about doing all this, of holding up this partnership, of, of doing X, Y, and Z? Um, and I read a study, uh, I think it was in the early 2000s was when the study was done, um, but I read it a few years ago and just was remembering it recently, and it has stats on young people in the church. And so how do young people see themselves in the church? And so out of the people surveyed, these were some of the results from that. And it's that 13 years old uh, is the age that typically uh, teens make their decision to leave the church, to kind of leave behind their faith. Uh, 63% of young people uh, leave the church between ages 10 to 17, so that young adolescent to early adolescent area. And then 23% of adults say they made their decision to leave the church before age 10, Um, which I don't know about you, but when I first read those, I was kind of shocked. I mean, I work with young people, and I'm like, man, I can't believe that that's where things are. Um, And I don't say this to frighten you or to scare you or to make it seem like this is like going to be a bad ending to the story. Um, But really just to take a look at where we are, where we are in the world and where we are with young people in the church. That that youth ministry as a a thing that a church does was not really that prevalent a few decades ago. Uh, But the church has seen the need for young people to have a place in the church where they are welcomed and they feel like they belong and they can ask their questions, they can find their answers, they can connect to a deeper meaning. Because as we... As we move further um, in society and as things progress and develop uh, in good ways and not so good ways, um, the church is becoming a little less attractive and faith is becoming a little less popular, uh, a lot less popular. Um, And in this, we see reflected by these numbers that uh, young people are searching, that they want something real and they want to belong. They want acceptance, um, and they want to know that their voice is heard and their name is known. And so that again drives a lot of what we do and that desire to make each student feel like they are known um, by their small group leader, by their small group of course, um, and that they belong. And I think that especially in this middle school time frame where they're really, they're longing for acceptance in their groups, in their peers, in their different activities, there is that question of like, will I I be accepted? Am I good enough? Um, And they're not maybe outright asking that question, but that's underneath a lot of what they're seeing. I remember being a middle schooler and and having that exact experience of of wanting acceptance. And so when I look at these numbers, it, it reiterates the desire that this place, when they come, so Christ the Redeemer, when they come to rise, when they jump into their small group, um, that it's a place of unconditional acceptance, that they know that they are loved um, by first their small group, uh, but then ultimately, and in the bigger picture, by the Lord. And so beyond what we can teach them about, let's, you know, let's teach you about the faith, and let's teach you this, and let's teach you that, what can you learn, what can you understand, that's all very good. But beyond that, there is this underscoring desire that they know that they're loved by God in a way that is intentional and personal and just as real as the love that they experience from their friends and family. And that that love isn't going away, that that love is unconditional. Uh, Because we can want a good life for them, we can want success for them, um, but ultimately what I want for them is for them to know that they're loved by God uh, and that that love is not going anywhere. And that regardless of their success or regardless of the status of their life, that God's opinion of them doesn't change. And so that... um, that is one way we see, um, we meet, hopefully meet the need that they have to find that deeper connection of acceptance and belonging in the church and, and to the Lord in this family. Uh, because I think that when we look at the world out there, uh, that I worry that the practice of faith and um, of Catholicism, but of just faith in general, has become a little bit like going to the dentist, where it's like, I kind of remember that I should be doing this, and like if I skip out on it, I start to feel bad about it, and then when I get older, my mom calls me and says, like, when was the last time you went to the dentist? And it's like, oh gosh, I don't know, and you hope that you don't, when you go, that there's not going to be something really bad, um, like a cavity, or now I have to get, you know, braces, but it's kind of this, like, I know that I should do this, and it'd be a good idea for me to do it, but like, only if I remember, or only if I feel like it, because, you know, I don't really see the point, and most of the time in my life, I can get by without needing to go to the dentist, you know, maybe once a year but most of the time I'm not noticing that I have this deeper need or this deeper desire and I worry that that's that's what's happening in our practice of the faith with young people is that it's like well this is recommended that I that I do this or that I participate in this but if I don't what's the worst that can happen and so our desire is to present the faith in a way that is appealing and attractive um, and that 
shows them that they have a place to belong here uh, and that they are called to be much more than maybe they desire for themselves. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard um, Father Sean mentioned at the 11 o'clock Mass today that I was at at least um, about a new blessed in the church, uh, blessed Carlos Acutis, and he is a 15-year-old uh, soon to be saint. He's the first uh, blessed of the millennial generation. So he's one step away from being a canonized saint in the church. He was born in 1991. That is, that is mind-blowing. Uh, that saints, um, I, I know this in my head intellectually, that saints can be born at any time in any place and that they can be faithful to the Lord and live their faith in such a radical way that they achieve the crown of sainthood. But I think I kind of started to maybe doubt it. And when I saw this news come up recently, it was just such a beautiful reminder that young people can be saints that they can give their lives to the Lord and that the Lord can do incredible things through them. And Carlos, when you look at pictures of him, he looks like a teen that could be walking around today. He's wearing like Nikes and a hoodie. Like he's dressed like, like us. Um, and he was into computers. He had a love for uh, sharing about the Eucharist, that he was in, all, in so many senses a normal teen. Uh, but his love for God and his understanding of God's love for him changed his life. And that that type of change is possible for any young person today. And so that makes um, what we do in this partnership with you in desiring to nurture authentic faith in the lives of uh, your sons and daughters um, all the more um, important for us. Uh, And so I bring that up just to bring us back to our goal. And our goal is, again, like I just said, is to partner with you to nurture authentic faith in the lives of young people. There is a book that we um, have read and referred to um, in just our work called Sticky Faith. And it talks about this idea that every young person, like a big predictor of how um, they will hold on to their faith moving forward in life, is the number of people, of adults, that invest in them, that have an investment in their development and their growth and their spiritual life. And so how many supports and mentors do they need to be able to feel supported enough and cared for enough that they can stand on their own two feet when it comes to keeping their faith into adulthood. And the average number, the kind of gold number, is five. Five people for that sticky faith to actually stick. And so you as parents are, are part of that five. And we hope that their small group leader is part of that five. And we hope that their godparents and their confirmation sponsor are part of that five. Um, and really, we want each child to not feel alone in this journey. Um, and I know that as we get closer to high school, confirmation is on the horizon, and we're thinking, okay, that's the next thing coming up. And in seventh grade, this is a great time to start kind of having the wheels turn about this. And it's, there's no requirements yet in, in you know, regards to confirmation, but it's a great time to start thinking about the, what's coming up and thinking about, okay, what do we want this experience to be like for them? Um, and who can be that, that sticky faith point person for them as a sponsor that's going to walk with them? Because they're you know, who they might want to be their sponsor could start journeying with them now. And how incredible would it be when they come to confirmation that they've already been having these conversations about faith and about God and about their relationship with him a couple years ago. And so to start, you know, while, while we have this year of seventh grade where there, there isn't a retreat, there isn't service yet, um, but there is this opportunity to take the next step and to take, um, to take this opportunity to, to rise up a little bit. And that's why I think a little bit of why we call it rise is that they're, they're rising up. They're not a child as much anymore, and they're rising into um, their teenage years, and they're rising up, standing up on their own two feet and saying, what do I believe and do I understand this? So that when they get to the end of this this journey that we're on right now, not the overall journey, but just this um, youth ministry journey, uh, that they can stand up in front of the bishop at their confirmation and say with their entire heart and soul that they know what they believe and that they actually believe it, not because someone else is, is making them do it or pushing them to do it, but they actually can stand on their own two feet and say that. And that's kind of the goal and the vision looking forward. And it begins with what we're doing now uh, and how we're meeting them now and how we're partnering together to nurture this uh, authentic response of faith. And so with all of that, I'll open it up to questions in just a second if there are any questions that you have. Um, but... Um, just, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for making this choice to invest in your child's faith, to partner with us. Uh, it is a privilege to partner with you. Um, and I really respect the role that you have as parents um, because I think the best thing that my parents ever gave me was an understanding of, of God loving me. And they weren't perfect and they aren't now, and I'm not perfect either. Um, but they instilled in me from a young age that, that God loved me and that he was real. Um, and that, you know, laid the foundation so that when life got really hard and when things happened that made, um, that made me struggle and question and start to actually be like, God, are you, are you really there? Are you even 
you know, with me at all. That I wasn't just a question I, you know, shouted into the void and then I just kind of left my faith like those statistics and walked away from it, but I had the foundation of what my parents gave to me in, in their faith that they passed on. And so that's the incredible role that you have and that I'm so grateful for, to my own parents for providing um, so that they have your, your faith that you pass on to them as a guiding lamppost on their journey moving forward. And so uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, um, but um, just I would like, like to end with just saying that we're on your team. We're on your team and we're here to help. Uh, and so whatever that looks like for you or how we can help, we want to be able to do that. Um, I'd also love to ask for your help if you're able to. Uh, in a specific way, we're in need of hall monitors at RISE on Wednesday nights. Uh, so hall monitors are volunteers that come just during the length of the session and they help with check-in as students arrive and then they are in the hallways while students are in small groups so that if something happens in a small group where they need assistance or um, there's a kid that forgets where his his room is and he's wandering around like which group do I go to, you as the hall monitor are stationed around the hallway to say, oh, this is where you go or to answer a question. It's it's usually a pretty mild um, job. There's not a lot that there needs to be done, but we do need people um, there to be able to keep eyes on everyone with all the moving pieces. And so we currently do need extra hall monitors for RISE for the early session and the, uh, the later session. So if that's something that you're able to do uh, that you have the availability for, even if it's only a couple nights uh, a month, that would be uh, of a huge help to us. Uh, and so if you're able to do that, if you're able to hall monitor, um, that would be excellent. And you can let Stacy know um, through an email or you can email me if it's easier. Uh, but if you're able to help us by hall monitoring, that would be wonderful. Um, so I'd love to open it up to any questions, if there are any, um, it's just for the body, um, anything that's good for everyone to know. And if not, um, if you have a more personal question, you can stop back afterwards and I will stay here to answer any of those. But any general questions? It's the first time I stopped talking in like 40 minutes. <sighs> Deep breath. Okay. Awesome. Well, as I mentioned before, if you can, before you leave, take a second to fill out that orange little half sheet with any intentions that you have. Even if it's, you know, if it's for your extended family, we'll pray for them as well. Uh, it would be uh, an honor to do so. But to fill that out, and you can leave it on your seat or drop it on the table on your way out. Uh, but again, I'll be here after we close in prayer if you have any other questions uh, at all. And thank you so much. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so the question was about kind of the flow of the night and what topics we do talk about and how they relate to our relationship with God. Um, so that's funny that she says that because it is kind of the like token answer. We talked about Jesus. We talked about God. God's always the answer, right? We talk about our relationship, which is, is true. I hope that they do talk about their relationship with God. But we do have a different topic every night. Um, we have a 15 to 20 minute video teaching on that that they're shown. Um, and actually, if you are on the website, ctryouth.com, and you go to the calendar, tab and it's going to show you the month view so it, you'll see October you'll see all the dates you'll see when we have rise and encounter scheduled on the Sundays and Wednesdays if you click on seven, seven o'clock rise Wednesday on any given night throughout the semester if you click on that it'll open up and it'll tell you the topic for the night uh, so it tells you what's um what's scheduled currently and what's coming up in the next semester and so any of the those given nights you can click on that and then um I believe I've, I think I've sent it out before in the just in-person flock note for how parents can access the additional materials that we create. Um, but if not, I'll send it out again this, this coming Monday. Um, but you can also see the topics listed on the parent resource page. So, it, so for example, our first night was just our kickoff night, and then the second night we talked about the existence of God. How do we know that God exists? How does he um, show us uh, that he exists and where do we find signs of his existence. So that was our first topic for the year and you'll see under that a few different resources. And then the past few weeks we've actually been working through the Trinity. So existence of God and then we've been working through um, Revelation, how God reveals himself to us. Um, and then God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the next ones on deck. Like I mentioned, we do usually typically talk about those ones in the fall. Uh, and so 
That's the lineup of the current uh, topics we've covered and where we are kind of right now. Um, that I can rattle off off the top of my head. I don't know if I would get all of the rest of them in exact order, but they are on the website. So if you click on that calendar tab and you see the month view, you just click on e any individual date and you'll see the topic for the night on there. And then you can say, oh, you talked about your relationship with God. Well, I heard that you talked about the Holy Spirit. So how does that, what does that have to do with your relationship with God? And she'll go, what? how'd you know? Um, but that's a, that's a, I mean, if you have the inside track, that's a great way to be like, no, 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 let's like talk about this more. And to be able to share yourself of like, I knew that that was the topic that you guys were talking about this week. And this was, not, was something that I was thinking about that I wanted to share with you. And they're going to be like, oh, don't, I don't want to hear it. I already talked about it for an hour. But it's this cool opportunity for you to be able to say, like, I have a connection with this too. And so to be able to kind of bridge that gap again. But yes, you'll see all of them on the calendar. And we, they, we probably do talk at some point in their conversation about how does this relate to your relationship with God? Because we never want to leave it as just, this is just something you have to know because it's important. But we want to be able to connect it to something deeper. So that even when we talk about the church hierarchy and magisterium, which they're like, that's not maybe super interesting to me. We're like, okay, let's learn about this, but then let's connect it. How does this impact your relationship with God? So we're really interested in that application step. So it's not just, again, knowledge or information that I hear, but I actually apply it to my own life. So that might be also why she's saying that, but it also might be the, kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card of, like, we talked about this. Anyway, um, I know that's probably what I would have done in middle school is, like, we talked about Jesus. What do you, what do you want me to say? Um, but, yeah, you can see every topic on the calendar. Awesome. All right. Well, we are uh, finishing with time so that you can get to 5 o'clock Mass if that was your plan today. Uh, but we'll close here in a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, I thank you and I praise you uh, for just the gift that each of these parents are to their children, Lord God. Uh, I thank you that you saw from the beginning of time exactly um, the soul that you were going to entrust to each of these parents and that you gave them their children with a specific desire in mind. Uh, and you've given them uh, the grace to love their child uh, in the way that you uh, have designed. And so I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for just this intentionality that you show uh, and the way that you love each of us and that you love others through us. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would pour into our hearts abundantly all the grace that we need uh, to be better parents, uh, to be witnesses of your love, and that you would hold us close to your heart each and every day, Lord God, that we would know that we're not alone in this journey that you are by our side in every moment to guide and strengthen us. And we offer this time and this year and this moment in our lives all to your glory, Lord God. As we pray, all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.